All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're tuning in from, uh, from around the world, and welcome to the first Global Biodiversity Festival. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for a good portion of the next three days. I'm the founder of the nonprofit Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, where we bring science, exploration, conservation, and adventure live into classrooms across the planet through virtual speakers and field trips. So since 2015, we've run uh, well over 1,500 live events, connecting hundreds of thousands of students to scientists and explorers uh, in over 80 countries. So check us out at exploringbytheseat.com. So you'll be meeting several other amazing hosts throughout the weekend, including Paul Rose, Wes Delavola, and Jesse Hildebrand. And I want to give a huge shout out to Dan Klein, who's helping out massively uh, behind the scenes with the Global Biodiversity Festival. So the idea for this weekend came together three weeks ago, and we quickly assembled an incredible team of over 60 scientists, explorers, conservationists, policymakers, photographers, and filmmakers from around the world who have experienced the incredible variety of life on our planet and been on the front lines of tackling how to document and protect it. So over the weekend, we're going to share the weird and the wonderful, the challenges life on our planet faces, largely due to our human impact, as well as some good news conservation stories from around the world. So I want to go through a few uh, housekeeping items as I see people starting to join us via the live YouTube stream. So please take some time to share your participation over the weekend via social media. We're using Global Biofest as our hashtag. And then take some time to get outside, get into your backyard and your neighborhood, snap some photos of biodiversity, then post them on Twitter and Instagram using Backyard Bio as your hashtag. Tag whether it's a mammal or an insect, identify it if you can. We want to see a global snapshot of what's in everyone's backyard. It's amazing what you can find if you really take a look, uh, especially if you get down low. So the Global Biodiversity Festival is 100% free uh, for all to join, but we are raising some funds for six incredible conservation groups, Planet Madagascar, Old Pejeta Conservancy, Rwanda Wildlife Conservation Association, Toucan Rescue Ranch, the Turtle Hospital, and OSA Conservation. So a donation doesn't have to be much, a little can go a long way, especially multiplied many times. Our goal is to raise $10,000 uh, over the three days. And if we do raise more than that, we'll make some donations to some of the conservation organizations run by some of our speakers. So donate on our website, globalbiofest.com. We also have a GoFundMe page going. You can find that on the website uh, as well. All right. So moving right along, we're thrilled to be able to share an address now from Elizabeth Marima. She is the Secretariat of the Convention of Biological Diversity uh, on Biodiversity Day 2020. So I'm going to share my screen now and we're going to get uh, that video rolling. So bear with me for just a moment. The International Day for Biodiversity gives us the chance to celebrate the incredible variety of life on Earth, to appreciate nature's innumerable contributions to our everyday lives, and to reflect on how it connects us all. The pandemic serves as a stark reminder that we need urgent, sweeping international cooperation to preserve nature conserve biodiversity and protect human health for generations to come. This year's theme, Our Solutions Are in Nature, highlights that biodiversity remains the answer to sustainable development challenges. From nature-based solutions to climate change, food, water security, and sustainable livelihood, biodiversity remains the basis for sustainable future. Communities are facing the danger of even more unprecedented negative economic, social, and human consequences if we do not act now and adopt a way of life in living with nature. Biodiversity loss is a direct result of short-sighted human activities, including uncontrolled mining and infrastructure development and sustainable farming and deforestation. All these have degraded ecosystems and have created the conditions that lead to events like pandemics. While the world is striving 
to end this pandemic, we all need to take urgent actions to build a resilient and sustainable global economy that incorporates nature at its heart, even as we build back from the crisis. Millions of jobs in sectors such as forest, fisheries, agriculture, tourism, and pharmaceuticals are heavily dependent on nature. Recovery plans that build a transition to biodiversity-friendly economies will create more jobs and provide decent livelihoods. About 1 billion people living in extreme poverty are in rural areas where employment opportunities are already scarce. Their household income is based on ecosystems and natural goods that make up between 50 and 90% of the so-called GDP of the poor. Governments should use the occasion of comprehensive recovery plans to build economies founded on the conservation and sustainable use of nature and the equitable sharing of its benefits. This will help all, including the most vulnerable. We need the world to continue to work towards an ambitious and effective post-2020 global biodiversity framework to be agreed at our next conference of the parties. This framework can contribute to increasing nature's benefits for the people. The results will be extensive, including improved global nutrition and access to drinking water, resilience to natural disasters, and nature-based solutions to achieve the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. All of this is integral to sustainable development goals, which risk being undermined as the result of the pandemic. This pandemic has shown in clear terms that international cooperation is paramount for the health of our nature, our economies, and our people. Let us work together and support solutions that are in nature. Happy Biodiversity Day. All right. Well, obviously, a massive thank you uh, to Elizabeth for that amazing address. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing and sharing that incredibly important message with us because our survival on this planet absolutely depends uh, on biodiversity and how we protect it. All right. Let's keep things moving right along. We're going to jump into our first event. I'm going to unmute and turn on a camera here. There we go. All right, so we have Amy. Amy, how are you doing? Very well. Thanks, Joe. Good to be here. All right. Well, Amy, it's so great to have you joining us live. You are the guinea pig. You are our first speaker of what's going to be a wild three days. We're so excited uh, to have you joining us today. So for those who are joining us, Amy Dickman is the founder and director of Tanzania's uh, Ruaha Con Carnivore Project, which is works with human to reduce human wildlife conflict and empower local communities through conservation. So Amy, we have had the pleasure of meeting a couple times uh, in the past. You do incredible work through your organization. We're so excited to learn a little bit more about it and then have a little discussion afterwards. Thanks a lot, Joe. All right, I'm gonna start by trying to share my screen. Uh, this is always fun. If that's working on a presenter view. Do you see that? Is that the right way? Uh, it is nice and full screen. We are good. Cool. All right. Well, great to be here. Thanks, Joe. And thanks everyone who is tuning in. It's such an honor and a privilege to be here talking at this event. And it's just, it's so inspiring. I think we're all a bit fed up with lockdown and feeling cooped up. So this is such a great experience of getting out there, appreciating the biodiversity, not only in our own backyards, but around the world. So honestly, a huge pleasure to be here. And as I have got the first slot in the festival, I'm going to abuse it by trying to persuade you that despite all the incredible species that you're gonna be uh, hearing about over the next three days, big cats are by far and away the most incredible and the most amazing you're gonna hear about. So big cats are just fascinating, amazing, incredible species. They are obviously by their own nature, they are big, they are powerful, they are ferocious, they're dangerous, they're so beautiful. 
And there's something so charismatic about animals that have the ability to kill you and yet are so beautiful and fascinating at the same time. And that, that real fascination that we've had with big cats has persisted throughout human history. For as long as we have existed, we have loved big cats. And that can be seen in our earliest history. So the first figurative art was carved out of woolly mammoth ivory um, called the Loan Mench, had the head of a lion on, um, on the body of a human. Similarly, if you look at uh, cave art from France over 30,000 years ago, it shows extensive depictions of lions. Interestingly, the male lions there don't appear to have manes, but it is clear that people have watched these cats and been fascinated by them for millennia. And that has really been shown through symbolism throughout our history. Um, big cats, particularly lions, have really permeated everything from our coats of arms, our heraldry. They have been used to advertise everything from sports teams to uh, snacks, everything from fuel to football teams. So really they have been absolutely central to our culture. Even the door knocker on 10 Downing Street is the head of a lion. So that value isn't just symbolic though. They also have very real tangible value today. So they have multiple different types of value. They have great ecological value. You know that if you have top carnivores out in a wild ecosystem, you've got a functioning ecosystem. They help control prey numbers and they just represent the fact that you've got this wild, healthy system out there. They've also got great, sorry, they've also got great economic value through things like photo tourism and trophy hunting. They generate revenue for national governments to incentivize the maintenance of habitat for these amazing species and many other species besides. They've also got really important existence value. Even if you are never lucky enough to go out and see these amazing species in the wild, people just like to know that we have a world, a planet that is still wild enough that there are patches of it where these incredible, ferocious, primal animals still exist and are predators in, in the way that they were designed to be, you know, the way that they have evolved to be these apex carnivores, they're still out there. And people love the fact that this is a symbolism of how wild our earth can still be. But despite all that value, unfortunately, it hasn't resulted in effective protection. A species like the cheetah has disappeared from over 90% of its historic range. And then you've got a species like the tiger, where unfortunately there are thought to be more tigers captive in the US now than are left out in the wild. Even a species as iconic as the lion. I talked about how particularly that seemed to be symbolic through history. And in fact, lions are the most common national animal in the world. People are horrified now when you say to them that there are now fewer wild lions left than rhinos. For whatever reason, when people think about threatened species, they tend to think about elephants, they think about rhinos or gorillas, and so when you talk to them and you say that there are now 14 times fewer lions left than elephants or gorillas, people are really horrified. And it's not to say that we shouldn't value and really, really work towards protecting rhinos and elephants and gorillas and all the others, but for an animal that has been so central to our culture, we are failing it by not providing it with better protection and not by not highlighting the threat to this most amazing, but also very fragile animal. So to talk about lions in particular, this is the historic range of lions. So they used to be distributed throughout Africa. And now this is our sort of best estimate at the moment of where the current ranges are. And the main threats, the main huge contraction of that range, they've also disappeared from over 90% of their range. And there are somewhere around potentially 24,000 lions left. And only five big populations that have around 1,000 lions left in them. The main reasons for those threats are the loss and the degradation of wild habitat, the loss of wild prey, and conflict with local people because these animals pose a real threat to people's livestock and sometimes to people themselves. Tanzania is the most important country left for lions. It has around 40% of the world's lions. Ruaha in the center of Tanzania is one of those strongholds and the biggest stronghold for lions is actually in Salu, uh, yeah, Salu which is down here in southern Tanzania. So I work in the Ruaha landscape as I said, one of the most important strongholds. And another thing that we have to remember that people also don't realize about lions is that they rely extensively on human dominated land as well as parks. And particularly the areas just around parks are really important for lions and for other big cats. But it does mean that their occupation of those areas means they are relying on the same land as extremely poor people. And these people can be very vulnerable. These are some of the villages around Ruaha. Many people here are living on less than a dollar a day of income. They don't have access to clean water, improved sanitation, good health care. Um, lots of, sort of they, they are very food insecure, so they're really very vulnerable. And they're living alongside some of the most important big cat populations left on the planet. That can often be an extra pressure. Those big cats kill livestock. And the livestock to these people, particularly traditional pastoralists, 
have really important economic value and also cultural value. So this has a huge cost to local people. And people unsurprisingly then respond by killing big cats, either in retaliation for attacks or to prevent the risk of such attacks happening in the first place. And this is a major threat, not only to lions, but to other big cats. So I started the Roja Carnival project in 2009 try to understand whether conflict was a major issue for big cats around Ruaha and whether we could do anything about it. So we set up the field camp, it took about 20 minutes. It was myself and two Tanzanians uh, under a tree, this is still the tree that my tent is under today. Um, the project's grown a lot, the tent has only grown a bit unfortunately, but we, you know, we uh, were centered on village land because we really wanted to understand the perspective of the people living right alongside big cats so that we could see their perspectives and understand how many big cats they were killing and why. In answer to the first question, people were killing a lot of big cats. These are distressing pictures of people I realize may not be what you want to see first thing in the morning, but we have to be able to confront the reality of what is happening on the ground. When people think about threats to species like lions, often you only hear about the very publicized ones. People tend to hear a lot about things like trophy hunting. It's worth remembering that in this area, at least, the amount of killing that we were seeing on village land was a hundred times higher than it would have been in this was, if this was a trophy hunting area. So this is a very hidden threat, but a very real one. It isn't on social media. You don't have people reacting in the same way to it. And it's a complicated threat. There isn't an obvious evil thing here. This is happening because people are understandably nervous about having these cats around them. So it's fundamentally important that we address this major threat and that we do it in partnership with local people, not seeing them as the enemy. So as part of that, when we talked to people about who was killing all these cats, people again and again said, that we needed to talk particularly with the Barabeg tribe. Now, most people haven't heard of the Barabeg. They're actually a sister tribe to the Maasai. They are traditional pastoralists. They wear black instead of red, um, but they are lo uh, known locally, at least, to be very secretive and very hostile to outsiders. So everyone said, you're just not gonna be able to work uh, with the Barabeg. And we tried, we tried everything in the book for two years, living on Barabeg land, trying to, have community meetings, break through with the Barabeg, and sure enough, they would run away from us rather than engage. And this was really depressing. We thought after two years that maybe it was true that we couldn't work with them. And so we decided uh, we would have to try some other measures. We were thinking about what to do. Maybe we just couldn't work with the Barabeg. And then we put up solar panels at camp to charge our laptops. And suddenly then the Barabeg turned up to charge their mobile phones. And it just, it still kills me now that I didn't think of this, because of course it's the last thing that any one of us would give up in the bush is our mobile phone. And that is true for the Barabeg as well. They use it for everything from tracking livestock prices to reporting if cattle or children have gone missing in the bush. And before they used to have to walk many kilometers to charge their phones. So now we had a charging station. It was an opportunity for them to come and sit at the camp and just, just start to break down some of the barriers and just start to understand a little bit of what we were doing and start to get some basic communication going. And that led eventually to us being invited down to one of their traditional tribal meetings, the first time they'd had outsiders and certainly a Westerner at these meetings. And we had this amazing talk with them where they really discussed the issues they were facing with big cats. And we could come up with some shared solutions about how to address the issue and see if we could reduce the amount of killing going on. So the first thing they talked about, as I alluded to before, this issue of attacks on livestock was hugely important. This is a major cost for very vulnerable households, particularly when you've got multiple animals being killed in one event. This could wipe out an entire family's livelihood. So really important to address attacks. But it was about much more than attacks. Many people said they had no benefits at all from the presence of wildlife, even though they lived right by a big national park. And the few people that did get benefits were not those who suffered most of the costs. So the costs and benefits were unevenly distributed across the people. Thirdly, the warriors talked to about us about the fact that killing lions still had significant cultural value to them. If they went out and killed a lion, they got gifts of cattle from the other um, community members. So this was a way of them getting money and wealth. And also it gave them status. Women would see them as important men in the community and want to marry them. So this was really important to understand from the warrior's point of view. There was also a real lack of conservation awareness. People had no idea that lions were threatened, that Tanzania and Ruaha were such strongholds for them, that their actions could actually be having global consequences. When we started to work with them on how to address these issues, the first thing we wanted to do was look at reducing attacks because it had such important economic and cultural consequences for people. Two thirds of attacks happened in poorly constructed livestock enclosures, like this one, this is a leopard attack. I could jump over that, so it's not very challenging for a leopard. 
And so we've reinforced them with a cost sharing basis of the local people with six foot high diamond mesh fencing. Now this doesn't look very impressive as a sort of lion proof barrier. If you went into a zoo and that was their lion fence, you would probably leave fairly quickly. But actually it's really effective. These have reduced attacks in uh, enclosures by about 95%. What you don't want to do is just delay an attack by 12 hours and have them released in the morning to slightly hungrier carnivores. So we encourage them to invest, to, uh, invest in specialized livestock guarding dogs. These are Anatolian shepherd dogs we got from the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia. And when you give them to farmers, they look at you sort of askance to say, you know, this looks like an appetizer for a lion. They actually grow to be very big and impressive very quickly. Actually, it's a problem they grow so fast for very poor communities. And so now we're looking at crossbreeding them with village dogs, but they're actually very effective at alerting people to a risk out in the bush and enabling the people to come and move the livestock away or intervene. But more importantly than reducing attacks is providing benefits. And we asked local people which benefits they would most appreciate from wildlife presence, and they said education, healthcare, and veterinary medicine. So we've invested in primary school education. We have a school twinning program where international schools in the US, the UK, uh, provide $500 a year for a village school. And this provides basic things like books and pens and desks and chairs, really important for these schools. We've had 15 twins so far. We would like to do more if anyone's interested. But while primary school education is free, secondary school is not. And we found that most children were not going because people had to pay for it. So we started a, sim a scholarship program called the Simba Scholarship. This was the only time we ended up going against the community because the community said they didn't want girls to have the scholarships. They said girls would get married, they would get pregnant. It was a waste of time investing in them. Whereas we said we had to have half the scholarship set aside for girls. And over the last five, six years of doing this, we've seen a real change where the first girls are graduating. We're now um, sponsoring some of them to go into college. And it's been a real change to see that girls can do very well at school and can often be the top ranking scholars and actually go on and have a different path in the future. So that's been really exciting to see that change. When we have our scholar exams, we found that many children at primary school weren't passing the exam. When we talked to teachers, they said it was because they weren't getting food at school. So they walk long distances in the morning without breakfast. There's no kitchens or any food provision at school. So we started with the local women a porridge project and we feed over 800 children a day during this. It really makes a difference. We found those schools with the porridge project, families want to send their children to school so they get a good meal and the children are doing far better. We also invest in healthcare. We invest a lot with women in these programs and we have a particular focus on maternal and neonatal healthcare. Simple things like umbilical clips and training and midwifery kits, things that really make a fundamental difference to the likelihood of people surviving birth, which can be so dangerous in these communities. For veterinary medicines, we work with the authorities to help distribute veterinary medicines because people were losing nine times more livestock to, de to disease than to deprivation. However, while we were doing all this, people would wave at us. We felt we were doing a great job, but people were still killing wildlife. And why wouldn't they? You know, you would take the benefits and still kill the wildlife. At the same time, we were doing camera trapping. We found that people were stealing our camera traps. Again, why wouldn't you? They didn't feel engaged in the program. So we decided to bring these two issues together. And instead of us doing the camera trapping on village land, we put these camera traps out to the villagers. So the villagers are trained and equipped so that they do the camera trapping and they are employed to do it on village land. These are remote cameras, if anyone doesn't know them, that take a picture when a wild animal walks past. Really important for monitoring a wildlife presence. And so we found that once we had the community's camera trapping, we, were, we had a system developed with them where we gave them a certain number of points for every wild animal they photographed through their camera traps. We had more points for animals that were more threatened or caused more conflict. So something like a diptych, a small antelope, gets a thousand points. A primate, a baboon, gets 1500 points. It's per individual. So this shot of an impala and a boon got the village 2,500 points. We are biased towards carnivores. They cause most conflict. So this spotted hyena would get a village 10,000 points. It will also be the large, last picture you get before it eats your camera. Uh, lions will get you 15,000 points. And the top spot is the endangered African wild dog, the 20,000 points. As I mentioned, it was per animal. So this um, shot from Mahaninga village got the village 340,000 points. Now, every quarter, those points are translated into additional healthcare, education, and veterinary benefits for the villages. And each village that participates gets some of the benefits, but the more points they get, the more benefits they get. And this has now become a major driver of community development in the villages. The cultural issues, we worked with a group called Lion Guardians in Kenya to employ young men as lion conservationists. We call them lion defenders. So they could get money through the jobs in conservation. But we asked them how to replace the status 
And they said the most important thing would be learning how to read or write. So this was really important. All the line defenders are now numerous or literate. They travel once a year to Kenya. They are seen as the big guys in the community. And, uh, and they're really now seen as the, the young men that the women want to marry. So this has been a real transition for them. And improving conservation awareness. We take people into the park now. And even though most of these people live really close to the park, they've never been in because they don't have money, they don't have a vehicle. So this is fundamentally important for them to change their view and see animals in a non-threatening way. We also show them DVD nights, amazing films and imagery from all sorts of amazing media companies. But one of the biggest issues that we were finding that very few of these films had them in local languages. And yet again, that seemed like a barrier that people were not getting this conservation story in their own languages. So then we wrote a book uh, that just came out last year with the community called Dara and the Lion Defender. It explains the project from the point of a Barabay uh, boy and it's done in local languages. And this really shows that they are part of this story. This is their story, their actions make a difference. And it really starts to, to get community engagement and buy into this. We are really focused on building Tanzanian capacity. The project has grown from the three of us to over 70 people now, 95% of whom are local Tanzanians. And it's had real impact. The car in the core area, the carnivore attacks have been reduced by over 60% and the carnivore killing has been reduced by over 80%. And we've seen some real changes. Not long ago, a group of young men went to go out on a lion hunt and the women stood up and they said, you are killing the very thing that is enabling us to give birth safely and educate our children. We are not having it. And they put a ban on all lion and elephant hunting across that village. And that was so important. They didn't involve us at all, but that came from them. And it just shows how, if you embed the community, you make them the true partners with a real reason for conservation, it can make such a difference. And far from running away from us, we've now become a valued part of the local community. It's not perfect, but it's so much better than it was. And we need to do much more. There are many more villages we need to scale up and around Ruaha and look far beyond as well. We're expanding the project now into the Salu landscape that I mentioned at the beginning. But we cannot scale, you cannot have one project do this alone. The way that you scale is not by growth of a project, but it's through partnership. And we find, found that talking to colleagues, many of us were getting frustrated that people were working in isolation. They were seeing the same issues, the same problems. They weren't sharing information and successes and strategies. They had a competitive model. So six of us who run lion conservation projects across East Africa decided to band together and to share everything, our successes and our failures and our inspiration, just our support for each other to make the Pride Lion Conservation Alliance. This has been hugely important for me personally, and I'm sure for others in the Alliance, but we wanted to expand that model beyond just Pride, beyond just our project. And so in February, uh, Pride hosted the first um, African Women Conservation Leaders training. And this was an amazing and inspirational trip with these 30 incredible women from across Africa, because we really do need to empower local leaders in conservation, particularly women. And Dominique is right in the center of that photo and she'll be talking to you later today. So community conservation, when people think about community conservation, they tend to think about things like this, people working with local communities on the ground. But as I mentioned from the beginning, this big cats are a global asset. They are something that has fascinated the entire globe for as long as people have existed. We need everyone to take their role in recognizing that this global heritage needs a global solution. And that means the global community to come together and to be part of the solution. And that's why this festival is so important, hearing from all these people, seeing the solutions, sharing ideas, and just coming together, not only to celebrate biodiversity, but to see how we can work together to make a better future, not only for wildlife, but for people as well. So I'm really honored to be part of it. And thank you very much, Joe and everyone else. And I'm open for questions. All right. Well, Amy, first of all, thank you so much. I don't even know where to start. That was an incredible presentation. You set the bar pretty high. I think the, the other three days, many of the earlier speakers or the later speakers are watching. Um, they got to raise their game a little. That was an amazing presentation. You're doing incredible work. Thank you so much for sharing that story, some of that biodiversity and, you know, hearing, we hear a lot of the negative in the media. It's great to hear some good news conservation stories from time to time. Doesn't mean there's not a lot to be done, but it's great to hear that good things are being done. All right. So those tuning in, um, if you don't know, we have open Slido rooms for all of the individual events. So if you go to the speakers page on our website, under everybody's bio is a Slido room where you can put in some questions um, that we can ask the speakers in this short little period of time. Uh, after the presentation. So Amy, I have a couple questions here for you. And I want to start off with, can you trace where your, your passion, your, your love for big cats came from? And tell us a little bit about your first wild big cat experience. Uh, I can't really, it's always been innate. I mean, I've got a picture of me where I'm meant to be giving my younger sister a bottle. 
and I'm completely ignoring her and she's lolling over the back of a sofa in a very unsafe way and I'm just fascinated reading the big book of big cats so and I must have been about five or six so it's been a passion that has always existed for me and actually my brother and I uh, buried a, a memory box saying what we wanted to be doing at the then unimaginable age of 30 and in mine I only had two things I said I wanted to be studying lions in the Serengeti and I wanted to have a zebra striped Land Rover. So those are my two big dreams. Uh, I still got to get the zebra striped Land Rover, but it's really, it's just always been a passion and a fascination for me. And I think in terms of my first wild lion experience, I started off actually in Namibia uh, with Laurie Mark at the Cheetah Conservation Farm for six years. I then went out to Tanzania to Rwaha and I very much remember my first night in Rwaha because I was a little bit nervous about being out there and having wild lions there and I had this tiny tent in the bush and actually a huge male lion came and snuggled up and slept on me in that very first night in the bush which was both one of the most incredible and terrifying experiences of my life but it was certainly uh, eventful. All right well that's that was one of the questions coming up was how did you feel that you know, that first camp you set up in the bush but I think I think you nailed it with that answer there putting that tent in the bush and and yeah sounds like a wild experience for your first time uh, out there. Very cool. So Alex uh, sent in a question via the Slido room and he's curious about, you hear so much about the justification that trophy hunting can be part of conservation. It can be a good conservation practice. Do you have a, a, an opinion on that? Well, my opinion, I personally, I don't like trophy hunting. I'm a vegetarian. Obviously everything that I do is trying to minimize killing. But I think the key is minimizing killing, not just going for reducing one type of killing. And while you know, trophy hunting can certainly be negative for individual populations, it can also, what it does is secures vast areas of habitat for wildlife. And if you take it away without providing another way of securing that wildlife um, habitat, then what you could do is actually take away a minor threat and increase a much bigger threat. So while many of us would like it to be taken away, the key thing is making sure there are viable, scalable alternatives in place first, because otherwise what we'll do is we'll stop seeing it on social media and you'll replace it with all these kinds of killings, which we won't see and which involve pregnant females and young animals are actually far more devastating. So it's something that is more complex than is first appreciated. All right, absolutely. Um, let's see. Another question we have here is hope. What's something that gives you hope um, in your line of work? I think I think the passion that people have for wildlife, I mean, even from I talked to my daughter the other day, who's five, and she said, God, when I grow up, I want to be, you know, I want to study wildlife. And she's, she's fascinated. I see it with my nieces and nephews. My uh, nephew Oliver is obsessed by these things. He sits and does the camera trapping work already. I think we have such an intrinsic passion for these species, that that is the thing, that if we just net harness that and really enable us to act on that in a positive way, we can use that passion and change for real good. And I think having seen through my work, we cannot see conservation development as, as opposing forces here. We have to say, how do we use this amazing biodiversity to deliver conservation with local people, with people across the world in a positive way? And I think I've seen that it can happen. And I think we have the overall will to make it happen. All right, we're gonna wrap up with one more question. Um, obviously we hope there's many young scientists, explorers, conservationists, policymakers who are tuning in uh, over the course of these three days, what's one piece of advice that you would give them? I think it sounds cliched, but really follow your dreams about what you want to do. I remember being told when I said I wanted to study big cats, even at university doing a zoology degree, they said, well, what's your plan B? I'm like, well, I don't have a plan B. And uh, I think don't go for your plan B. There is There are jobs out there. There are there is action, whatever you do, if you're an artist or a writer, there is something in you that can have a real power to change things. And so take that passion, take your skills and hopefully combine together, we can work together to make a better world. All right, amazing. Well, Amy, before we sign off, I wanna to talk to our audience very quickly. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning. During each of these events, there'll be about a five minute pause as we queue up the next live event. So if you need to go to the bathroom, if you need to grab a snack, if you wanna run outside and snap a cool picture of some biodiversity in your backyard, tagging backyard uh, bio, post them on Twitter and Instagram. We'd love to see them. Make sure you have your geo tagging on so we know where in the world you are and then tag it as a mammal or a bird or an insect. Identify it if you can. So we look forward to seeing everybody for the next event shortly. Amy, a huge thank you for joining us this morning, the incredible work you're doing and uh, thanks for kicking off the Global Biodiversity Festival. Thank you everyone, bye.